The future of our towns and cities and our lives within them is an everyday topic of conversation, but it's also complicated with lots of things to consider. What we're learning is how important greenery and green spaces are in helping with climate change, flooding, uh, public health and supporting wildlife and, and loads more. And in this film, you'll see and hear about research from the University of Salford, which connects with some of the benefits of being more active and local green spaces. My current work is around the meta theme of uh, radical green infrastructure, so ways in which we can bring new ideas and new projects into our cities. So everything from uh, green roofs or edible rooftops all the way through to urban farming, community growing, pocket parks and everything else in between as well. Such as our work with Northern Roots, the largest urban farm in the UK, there's a huge amount of benefit by having green space in our cities, whether it's in the form of a, a green roof or a community garden or an allotment for health and wellbeing purposes, for environmental biodiversity purposes. It's helping ultimately to make our cities more sustainable, particularly if we look at the urban food growing element of it, it's making our cities more resilient, the food system's more resilient as well. So if we look at Northern Roots, for example, the ambition there is to grow as much food locally as possible, to create jobs around green infrastructure as well, and to create short food supply chains that benefit the wider borough of Oldham. Well, my PhD research looks specifically at community gardens and care farms across the Greater Manchester region, working with older adults, anyone over 50, to try and work out their perceived and their actual health changes because of accessing these projects. What we found out in the project is that people are happier, healthier and feel more connected because of attending these projects. People feel happier because it provides a dedicated time in which they'll be able to socialise with others. We found out that these projects really provide a sense of community in the local area as well. People love to be able to work together to try and improve the natural spaces that they have in the local area. So I'm hoping that my research is really providing a platform to challenge ageism, to really show the benefit of using these projects, to be able to show what these older people get from the projects and really make cities more age friendly in the future. I work with others in the Health Active Cities team. We're interested in research that enables more people to enjoy the benefits of active travel. Walking and cycling are great ways to get around, especially when we consider the environmental and health implications of our transport system. Encouraging active travel is a really important part of increasing physical activity, reducing climate change emissions and improving air quality. Attractive walking and cycling routes make it possible and fun for people to access a green space and enjoy the wellbeing benefits. In our research we found that the quality of these routes is really important. People tell us that they want attractive spaces in which they feel safe to walk and cycle. So it's really important that we see investment that creates space for walking and cycling so that people can access the things they need day to day, whether that be work, school or green space. My research has shown how local, everyday green spaces, as part of typical exercise practice, uh, can provide stress relief and connections to nature. And I'm currently working on a project about how exercise, particularly running, um, and local green spaces come together to support our well-being. And I've learned about the importance particularly of traffic-free routes and how transitions between parks and streets can really influence our experience. This means for the future we should think about how exercise can be enabled by our built environment. Maybe thinking about routes for exercise through our towns and cities. This is important because of a number of bigger scale issues like population health trends, but also inequalities, which means that not everyone has safe access to these sorts of green spaces for their chosen exercise. My research interests centralise around inclusive active travel and environmentalism and particularly the barriers that disabled people face in being active within their everyday lives. A lot of disabled people want to be more active and that's also what a lot of the wider research around disability and activity shows but it also shows how extensive the barriers to activity are and these barriers are both physical barriers in terms of the infrastructures that we have in our cities but also the costs of activity for a lot of disabled people are more expensive than for non-disabled people, for example. So the cost of a trike like this one goes way beyond a two-wheel cycle. 
We also start to learn kind of how these processes of exclusion are embedded within design processes. So it's really important to recognise that disabled people are often experts of access because they have to spend so much time fighting for their own access. They will know a lot of technical details about what needs to be done and what's wrong. And it's kind of recognising those people as the experts. Access is important for everybody and benefits everybody. And if they are working for disabled people, then they're working for everybody. As a filmmaker, I work on films which show people local wildlife and educate them about the benefits of biodiversity on their doorstep. Not many people realise that Salford is actually 60% green space. I think people still think of the city as the dirty old town. But actually, the city has an excellent range of green spaces, including public parks, nature reserves, as well as the brilliant River Irwell that runs through the city centre. In my films, I try to help people learn about and connect with wildlife and nature, not as scientists, but in whatever way works for them. So that could be listening to birdsong in their local park, it could be watching the cherry blossom trees in the spring, it could just be enjoying the wildflower meadows in the summer. But more than that, I hope that my films inspire people to try and get outside and engage with some of these spaces. A lot of my research has been focused on social prescribing and how non-medical interventions can help promote well-being for individuals and communities. And a, a huge part of that work is how green social prescribing, so access to nature and being in nature actually informs populations and communities and how it encourages well-being. The work that we've been doing with the RHS Wellbeing Programme has enabled us to understand what referral pathways work and for which population. Some of the findings have highlighted that this programme has actually changed people's lives. In some instances, it saved people's lives. So what we've learned is one of the key challenges to green social prescribing is actually convincing healthcare professionals that a non-medical approach is a benefit, has taken some convincing. So our research has a massive impact in that area because it's given them the evidence that they need to support future social prescribing prescriptions through nature-based interventions.